the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. You know, all of us us carry a a burden around. It's like a constant weight on our back. For some of us, it's pretty light. Often you can go days without really noticing it. But every so often, it feels a bit uncomfortable and you wish that you could get rid of it. For others, it's close to breaking you. Feels like you won't be able to take another step forward because of the weight upon your back. Day by day, it weighs you down. It affects every aspect of your life. You struggle to remember a time when it wasn't heavy. And you think that you can't carry on if it got any heavier, and yet it does. There are times when it feels like someone is putting another brick onto the back, and it gets heavier and heavier as day by day carries on. Only, if only, this burden could be taken away. What is it? It can be described in five letters. G-U-I-L-T. Guilt. We feel guilty for the things that we've done and for the people that we've hurt, for the situations that we've made worse. We feel guilty for the things that we haven't done and the way that has damaged relationships and made things worse. And the problem with guilt is that it's a very lonely thing. You look around and you think nobody understands the way that I feel. Nobody's done the things that I have done. Nobody feels this burden in quite the same way as I do. I can't really share it because it will ruin the image that people have of me. But as we delve deeper, we get to the heart of our guilt. And the heart of our guilt is that it's like pain. See, pain tells us that something is wrong and it needs to change. If I put my hand somewhere hot, it is good that it hurts. It means I make a change and remove it before serious damage is done. Guilt tells us that something is wrong and needs to change. See, the root of guilt is sin. And the feelings that we have appoint us to something that needs to change. But even that can be thrown out of sync. Just as it is possible physically to feel pain even when there's nothing wrong, so it is possible for us to feel guilt when there isn't anything wrong. Those with an overly tender conscience can actually put their own weight onto the back of themselves, that burden. We carry this burden around. 
How about a contrast? Look with me at verse 12 in our passage. But when this priest, the Lord Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ does not feel burdened. There's no weight that he cannot carry, no guilt that he cannot deal with, and no fear that he isn't good enough. Not only is he sitting at the right hand of God, he is sitting comfortably. And it is my prayer and my hope that by the end of tonight, so you will be too, if you are united to him. And we're going to do that by going on a journey, a journey that this passage takes us through from guilt to freedom. We're going to see how our guilt can cause us to squirm in our chair, that we're not sitting comfortably because of that feeling. And whether it's legitimate guilt or not, we should look to Christ's sacrifice so that we can relax, so that we can sit comfortably in our Christian walk, knowing that our guilt has been removed and that in forgiveness, we can know freedom. So get comfy as we jump into Hebrews 10. It's a common moment, isn't it, in the human experience when guilt causes us to squirm in our chair. Whether it's the child in the classroom squirming because the teacher has had the rubber hit them on the back of the head and he's looking around to work out who it was. To the adult who knows that they've let down their nearest and dearest, who knows that they have done wrong. And they squirm as it is dealt with, as it comes to light. There's no excuse left. And so we just kind of wiggle around, wanting to be anywhere else other than where we are right now. You see, guilt destroys comfort. And it's crippling in the life of a Christian. See, we know what we've done in the past. We see what's happening now. We know that it's not worthy of what we've been called to. And it causes us to question everything. And in that, there's a deeper problem. And the problem is that our view of Jesus is too small. You see, I don't think really we would ever express it that way. It maybe sometimes we'd go to a brother or sister and say, my view of Jesus is too small. But I think probably rarely we would do that. But functionally, we don't believe that the cross is big enough to deal with everything that we have done and that we are doing. Or that Christ's sacrifice is sufficient to keep us going. And yet Christ is sitting comfortably. He doesn't have these concerns. And though he meets us in our weakness, though he understands our weakness, though he has been tempted in every way as we have, he meets us with unshakable, unbreakable, undefeatable power and love. Why? Because he gets it. He gets it. He sees the whole vista of his father's great salvation plan across time that Dan read to us at the beginning from Ephesians 1, brought to his culmination in his obedient sacrifice and then applied to a great multitude that no one can number by the Holy Spirit. Jesus gets it. He sees it all. And so he rests easy at the right hand of God. We need to glimpse what he sees and delight in what he's won, so that our burden may be lifted. As our passage begins here in Hebrews 10, we see a statement in verse 1 that we've become familiar with in our journey through Hebrews. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. Everything bound up in the old covenant is a shadow, a Lego model, of what was to come. In every way we've seen so far in Hebrews, Jesus is superior. In chapter 9, we went round the tabernacle, reinforcing that Jesus is a better priest. He's a better place to meet God. He's a better sacrifice. And the beginning of chapter 10 builds on that. 19 times in these 18 verses, we read sacrifice or offering. As the writer draws out the reality and the result of Christ's sacrifice upon the cross. And to begin, Mr. Hebrews takes us through the consequences of the law being only a shadow. What does it mean that this was just an imitation of the reality to come? And it's pretty conclusive. Middle of verse one. Uh, Not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? 
For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. <clears throat> but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. What's the big headline of this section? The law cannot remove the lasting burden of guilt and the knowledge of sin because the sacrifice is only bulls and goats. In fact, not only does it do that, but it actively reminds of sin. That annual ritual, the Day of Atonement, it was the majestic high point of the year when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God. Yet look at the language of verse 1. It can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Once you've been through a few in your younger days, you get the impression that this is how it is. That sin is a present reality. It always will be and we'll never truly get rid of it. We've got this ritual, but by the time everyone's cleared up at the end, we'll be back where we started. Now remember, these old covenant rituals, they weren't empty charades. A recurring phrase in the early chapters of Leviticus as it goes through all of the offerings is... And the offering will be accepted on your behalf and atonement will be made for you. Genuinely, there was something profound going on in what was talked about. The day of atonement was exactly that. It was a day where the sin was atoned for. As the high priest took the sacrifice goat into the presence of God, the blood led to atonement. As the other goat, the scapegoat, was taken into the wilderness with the confessed sin over it, it was a symbol that the Israelite sin literally was being taken away. God was promising to remember their sin no more. That was a reality. But unfortunately, it did nothing for your future, except guarantee that you would be back. Take away, in verse 4, is literally decisively remove. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to decisively remove sin. It can't do it. A better sacrifice needs to happen. The Day of Atonement was like a wiping clean of the slates. It cancelled what had happened over the previous year. But by that evening, you'd built up another debt. And you'd have to wait a year for that to be wiped out. And I sometimes wonder if we treat the cross like that. When we come to Christ, everything that we have done before that moment is forgiven. And we rejoice, as an Israelite would do on the Day of Atonement. My sin has been paid for. Hallelujah. Our slate has been wiped clean. But then we live as if it depends on us to remain in that state. That every subsequent sin, it is reliant upon me to deal with that. Jesus reset me, but then it's up to me. Again, We've got our theology in the right place. We wouldn't say that we believe that, but functionally, that's the way that we live. You see, that right and proper guilt that we feel over our sin, it should send us to the cross where we find not condemnation, but a love that nothing and no one can separate us from. But we try and deal with it ourselves. We resolve not to do it again. Right, I'm going to try really hard. I'm not going to do that again. We try and do it in our own strength. We look to behave better to cancel out what has gone before. I had a pretty bad day yesterday, but I'll have a really good day today, and that will, that will kind of balance it out. We turn to friends and family for help, and we talk about forgiveness and transformation without actually going to the one who forgives and who transforms, the one who loves, who longs to give good gifts to his people. And that will only cause the guilt to grow. If you're dealing with your sin anywhere and in any way other than the cross, you'll be lost in hopeless guilt. I wonder if you ever thought, how could an old covenant Israelite in the midst of the camp, going to the tabernacle and seeing it going on, watching and participating in the worship of the community, how could they know assurance and hope? They could understand that what they were seeing was just a shadow. And trust that one day the seed of the woman, the son of Abraham, the anointed one, would bring the reality that all of this pointed forward towards. And what they looked forward to 
we look back to, as we see the Lord Jesus take every sin that we have committed, that we are committing and will commit, and die in our place so that we may know life. Every single sin placed upon and within the Lord Jesus. He is sitting comfortably because he knows that your sin has been paid for. Every last one. Your guilt has been atoned for. And only life and freedom are in your future. I wonder, are you sitting as comfortably as he is? Or are you still squirming in your seat because you think it depends upon you? and not upon him. But how is it that he is sitting comfortably, and how can we do the same? What is it that Jesus has that sometimes we believe we don't have? Well, it's all through his perfect and his lasting sacrifice. See, Mr. Hebrews continues his comparison of the multiple sacrifices of the old covenant with the one sacrifice of the new. But this is no academic discussion. He is not simply teaching us high-end theology so that we can answer some questions. He lands it in the most glorious way. And if we grasp this, if we grasp what he was saying, it will transform our squirming in our seat to the most glorious of relaxation. What I'm hoping for is the spiritual equivalent of coming home after a really difficult and stressful and hard day and just falling into that sofa that is perfectly shaped for your body. And as you get in it, it kind of softens around you, and you just sit back and you go, ah, I want that spiritual equivalent tonight, as we can relax in all that Jesus has done. And the direction to that relaxation is there in verse 10 and verse 14, as the writer lands it. And by that will, we have been made holy, through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And verse 14, for by one sacrifice, he has made holy forever those, uh, sorry, made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now we'll come to that made holy and being made holy in a bit. But for now, I just want you to step back and marvel at those two verses. You and I are holy in God's eyes. You and I are perfect before him. And this will last forever. Just think about that. Cast your eyes over those verses and think about that. At the end of whatever week you've had, at the start of whatever this week will entail, this is what defines you. This is who you are. You are holy. You are perfect. You are eternally accepted by God. And it comes from the one sacrifice of the body of Christ. Now we see the build up to this in to this wonderful glory in verses five to seven, where Mr. Hebrews quotes Psalm 40, written by David, yet ultimately declared by Christ during his incarnation. Verse five, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. The old covenant sacrifices could never fully deal with sin and so could never fully please God. Yet as Christ comes, taking a body, giving himself willingly to the Father's will, everything those sacrifices were shadowing is seen. Verse 8. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, Jesus brings to an end the first system, and he establishes the new, the will of God, accomplished in him and it leads to the building of a holy people summed up in the contrast between the priests and the priest verse 11 day after day every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again 
sorry, religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Do you feel in that, when it talks about the priests of the old covenant, that relentless effort to not really get anywhere, day after day, again and again, never take away, but all leading to the glorious high of verse 12 and 13. From the glory of the triune relationship, Christ came to earth to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. From his atoning sacrifice upon the cross, to the victory of his resurrection as he strode from the tomb, to the majestic ascension where he sat down at his father's right side. Christ was the acceptable sacrifice who won every spiritual blessing for us that we've been thinking about this evening. All of which meant he could sit down. It was finished. The work was complete and so he sits. And he waits for that moment when his enemies will be made his footstool. That moment when his father says it is time for you to make everything new as he returns. And his comfort in his seat should lead to us relaxing in ours. See, verse 10 and verse 14 both speak of God's people being made. See, Christ is building his church and we are the living stones that he uses, building us into a holy temple for his glory. Where is the glory of God seen on earth? It is seen in the church. He has made us holy. His sacrifice removing all that is unclean. But he's also working on us by his spirit, making us holy, as verse 14 says, conforming us to the status that we already hold. He has declared us holy, and now he is making us holy. And his sacrifice has made us perfect forever. Not that we are sinless now, but that we can perfectly draw near to God. That's what chapter 7 was all about, how we can perfectly draw near to the God who has made us. See, Christ's seated position is an expression of his certainty into what he has built and what he has used to build it. He has no doubt that his sacrifice is enough to make the vilest sinner clean. There is nothing that anyone can have done in their past that a repentant heart and the sacrifice of God cannot deal with. He has no doubt that what he has done will mean that all that united to him can come before his father. See, back in verse 6, we read of sacrifices that the Lord was not pleased with. It's the same word that is used at the baptism of the Lord Jesus. We read it in Matthew 3. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. He wasn't pleased by those sacrifices and yet... He was pleased with his son. And the glory of the gospel is that verse 10 and verse 14 are as sure as Matthew 3. The words written in verse 10, the words written in verse 14 are as sure and as true as those from Matthew 3. Do you believe that the father is pleased with the son? Do you sit uncomfortably in your chair wondering whether Christ will be rejected? Of course you don't. Of course you don't. You know the relationship between father and son. You know that these words are true. Now take that certainty and apply it to verse 10 and apply it to verse 14. Look at what God has built and is building. It's why personal testimony is so encouraging. As we listen to people's stories of how they came to Christ, as we listen to people's testimonies of how they are continuing in Christ. Let's be asking one another, what is the Lord teaching you at the moment? Where have you seen him at work in your life in the past week, in the past month, in the past year? How are you more like the Lord Jesus than you were 10 years ago? Let's encourage each other with these words. And as we look over this passage, we will see how it is all about him. The Father's will, Christ's sacrifice, 
And if I can sneak into verse 15 to say the Holy Spirit's application of this work, it is all of God's. And Christ sits comfortably because he knows that the triune God can be relied upon. So where in your life do you need to relax? In what areas of your life do you need to apply the certainty of verse 10 and verse 14? Deeply understanding who you are in Christ. Glorying in the sacrifice that meant your vileness could be forgiven. And yet knowing that the Lord is pleased with you because of his son. Where are you too focused upon yourself and not focused enough on him? Where is tension being caused because you're trying to deal with everything rather than giving it to the God who made you and saved you? Christians bring God pleasure because of Christ's sacrifice. And that should bring glorious spiritual relaxation. It's not about my performance. It's about his. And he is perfect every moment of every day. Jesus isn't worried. So we shouldn't be either. And that spiritual relaxation framed by the truth of our forgiveness should lead to a wonderful freedom to serve as we were always made to do. You see, as we come to the end of our passage, the end of this long section, beginning in chapter 8, looking at Christ's superior work, we return to Jeremiah 31 to revel in that work. Verse 16, this is the covenant, sorry, verse 15. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I'll remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. You see, this was always God's plan to place his ways deep within us so that we will live for him. As Jeremiah looked forward, he could see the external work of the law. But he saw a time when it would be written inside us, when our very hearts would be new and we could live for God as we were meant to. And the covenant that Jeremiah foresaw, Christ brought and in that, it focuses on the eternal, internal renewal that leads to external transformation. So often we try and do it the other way around. We think if I can get the outside right, then my inside will, will be good as well. But no, it's about internal renewal that then goes to external transformation. And if we try and reverse those things, it will only land us in trouble. And then in this passage of amazing truths, how about verses 17 and 18 as a way to finish? Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. What grace there is. The omniscient God who knows all, who sees her all, who holds all of eternity in his mind, actively not remembering our sin for the sake of his son. Everything utterly and completely forgiven because of Christ's sacrifice. And so sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. No mass, no future sins and sacrifices in a rebuilt temple. No need for you to pay for your sin in whatever way that you think you need to. You have been forgiven. And so that sets you free to live for your God in radical and life changing ways. See, Christ sits comfortably because he sees the full extent of the gospel. But what will raise him from that position? What will get him out of his seat? His act of consummation as he comes to make all things new, as he comes to see his enemies made his footstool. What gets him out of his seat is the bringing of new creation. And in whatever time that we have, we should do the same. We are new creation, those with the law of God written upon our hearts, those who've been forgiven, whose sin God chooses not to remember, and that leads to liberating freedom. As we walk around Central and South Bristol, we are God's ambassadors. We are his envoys sent to bring this glorious news to all who need to know. We bring the transforming message of the gospel that the most important thing in anyone's life, their eternal destiny, can be sorted by the glory 
the glorious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. And so we go all in for him. We give it our all in the freedom that he has won for us. So what will that freedom look like this week? Look at these words from Psalm 118. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. Brothers and sisters, that is freedom. As we go out on mission this week, we are in a spacious place that the Lord has brought us into. And it's a spacious place because he is there. The Lord is with me. And because he is with me, whom shall I fear? Nobody. Because I am free in God. My eternal destiny is secure. My standing before him depends upon his son, not on my performance. So that frees me up to get it wrong. It frees me up to do things, not worried about whether I make a mistake or not. Because I'm doing it for him, in his strength, in his power, and surrounded by his love. What great things is he going to do through you this week? We've been on a journey from guilt to freedom. And we see that as with every other ill, the antidote is the cross. As we finish, I want to read one of my favorite passages from Pilgrim's Progress. Now I saw in my dream that the highway up which Christian was to go was fenced on either side with a wall, and that wall was called Salvation. I'm sorry, I've assumed that everybody knows what Pilgrim's Progress is. It's a book written in the 17th century, and it's an allegory. Uh, Christian is the kind of archetypal Christian, uh, and he walks through life um, seeing things that happen from a biblical point of view, but Bunyan, who wrote it, gives... uh, people to situations and but anyway that's what's going on uh but it's, it's from the context of someone having a dream and seeing all this play out so i didn't yeah i just assumed everybody knew uh and the war was called salvation up this way therefore did burdened christian run he was the place that we were at the start he's burdened but not without great difficulty because of the load on his back he ran thus till he came in a place somewhat ascending and upon that place stood a cross and a little below in the bottom a tomb So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up to the cross, his burden loosed from off his shoulders and fell from off his back and began to tumble. And so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the tomb where it fell in and I saw it no more. Then was Christian glad and lightsome and said with a merry heart, he hath given me rest by his sorrow and life by his death. Then he stood still a while to look and wonder, for it was very surprising to him that the sight of the cross should thus ease him of his burden. He looked, therefore, and looked again, even till the springs that were in his head sent the waters down his cheeks. Bunyan wrote that from a prison cell where he would say that his heart was glad and lightsome. And what I love is the way that Bunyan describes Christian's view. Did you see that? He looked, therefore, and looked again. Brothers and sisters, this week, look and look again at the cross. See the rest. See the life. Look and look again. And with tears in your eyes, delight that your guilt has been taken away, that your sin has been atoned for. Rejoice that your burden has been lifted. And that you can freely serve the God who did it all. And delight that you are united to the risen, the ascended, and the seated Christ. In such a profound way that this is true. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Are you sitting comfortably? Yes, you are. So believe it.